Welcome to the Weekly Checkup. We're brought to you by George Urology. I'm your host, Dr. Bruce Feinberg. It was beautiful this morning. It makes you feel like the first day of spring. I saw my first cherry blossom, saw daffodils coming up in the garden, made me think I needed to go out and get in a run, and I did. Went to Piedmont Park and got in a run, and uh, I think I tweaked my hamstring, Um, which made me think about today's show because we're talking about orthopedic spine and neck problems. We're talking about um, surgical but also non-surgical treatment. And I'm thinking about all those weekend warriors who get a, to a weekend like this and the first thing they think of is going out there and doing things they haven't done in months and the end result is injury. Or it's chronic injury and it gets reactivated. Um, so it just made me think that we are so spot on with our topic today. We're going to talk about orthopedic and spine surgery with one of Atlanta's leading experts, let experts, Dr. James Chappius of Orthopedic and Spine Surgery of Atlanta. We're going to cover chronic neck, pain, chronic back pain, acute back pain, sports injury, surgical options, rehab, uh, non-surgical options, and as well get into uh, uh, what is growing to be quite a controversy, and that's that over the treatment of certain diseases of the back with fusion and why that's changing and what to do if you've had fusion now having problems, but you're being told there are no answers for that. So lots to talk about today. Give us a call, 404-872-0750. That's 404 404- 872-0750. Dr. Chapius is the founder, lead surgeon, and CEO of Spine Surgery of Atlanta. He's a clinical instructor with Georgia Regents University, former the medic- formerly the Medical College of Georgia, and has staff privileges at Emory University Hospital Midtown. He's a published author, frequent principal investigator for research trials, the owner of several patents for surgical products, and one of the country's 207 spine surgeons and specialists to know according to Becker's Orthopedics. You can learn more about him and the practice at SpineCenterAtlanta.com. Jim, great to have you back on the show. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks for having me. And and lots to cover again. So, you know, really, this all begins with neck pain and back pain. Yes. And that's only the most common complaint in America, or at least by the research that's done, the most common reason that people go to their primary care, adults go to their primary care doctors. Um, So... um, Where do you start when you begin, I guess, with chronic or recurring or acute neck and back pain? I would think it would be, what can you do to prevent it in the first place? Yes, yeah, thanks, Bruce. I mean, I guess the first uh, step would be home remedies, uh, ice packs, heating pack pads, um, anti-inflammatories, weight loss. If those things don't work, then I think generally it's time to see – some specialist or your primary care doctor to see what's available after that. Of course, physical therapy with stretching, um, if you're a smoker, stopping smoking. And, and as we talked about, losing weight uh, is, is are big factors early on. So I, I would think that um, for, for so many people who are out there, um, they probably perceive that their level of physical condition is better than it probably is. And and, and how much of it is the level of sh- what kind of shape you're in more than just a weight? You know, can you do anything for your back that really is training? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, stretching, <clears throat> as you mentioned earlier, stretching your hamstrings and uh, Pilates, core stabilization type exercises are big. If you're going to do aerobic exercises, it's really important that you stretch before and after your activity. So, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, it, it reminds me, I've often talked about this, that, you know, with four kids, the, the greatest concern to a, a new parent is sudden infant death syndrome. And you're wondering, where is he going with this? But um, with each kid, the recommendation was different. For my first kid, it was lying on their belly. The second was lying on their side. The third was lying on their back. And the fourth was lying on their belly again, which, you know, makes people crazy because they think that we know what we're talking about as doctors. So the idea that stretching keeps showing up, it seems, every year there's a story, USA Today, New York Times, whatever, that you do need to stretch or stretching doesn't help. So you know, is the science really solid behind stretching or, you know, it can hurt, so you're better off doing it than not doing it? Or is the science coming around and stretching really works? Well, I can really just comment at Spine Center Atlanta, we recommend stretching for back problems. I think the hamstring, when it gets tight, it throws off the biomechanics of the lower back. So it's real important with spine problems, back pain, that you stretch your hamstring. So, and how do you know that your hamstring is adequately stretched. So, you know, is you have to be able to touch your toes? I mean, but, but I've all, you know, so I do Pilates and, you know, I was talking to the instructor about the fact that I feel like I have made so much progress in my hamstring, but then I had this issue with my running and he said, well, you know, I think most of your increased range of motion that you're perceiving as hamstring is actually coming from your shoulder, 
you know, it's like you're reaching better, but I'm not sure it's all coming from your hamstring stretch. So is there a way to know if your hamstrings are stretched or not stretched? Well, I, I think you can tell that when you put your heel up on a table or a bar and you go to stretch. I mean, there's a certain level that you should be able to flex forward at the, uh, at the waist. And if you're uh, extremely far away from that, then you're, you're probably tight. But if you're not sure, you can always go to a physical therapist, someone like that, who can stretch them for you and give you an idea where you are and maybe even give you some tips on how to stretch. So bending over the waist and being able to grab your ankles or touch your toes with a straight knee. It, that's ideal. And in, in fact, we even published an article in the Physician in Sports Medicine. Uh, we called it the Super Six Stretching Exercises for Golfers. And we developed this for a Payne Stewart when he was alive to help golfers. And one of the big problems that they have um, is stretching the hamstrings. So if anyone's interested, that's a nice article to look at. And for is that stretching. on your website? It's on our website and it's published in Physician and Sports Medicine Journal. All right. So give me the article name again and the website name again, because I think that's one where they're going to be listening who want to go look that one up. It's super six stretching exercises for golfers. It was published in Physician and Sports Medicine Journal probably in the mid-90s. And the link to it's on the website. Yes. Okay, that's really cool. Let's go ahead and hit the phones, and we will talk to Robert in Eatonton. Robert, how you doing? I am good, gentlemen. I hope you all are doing well or same. We are doing fabulous on a day like today. What's up? Okay, I, you hit on something when you were talking about problems, and I had an L5S1 fusion uh, back in 2007, wasn't told not to do the same job, so I went back in as an auto mechanic. A lot of bending at the waist and all of this. Well, I had I had um, what they call belt back syndrome in 2009, uh, severely dis disabling pain. Uh, I go for injections because I've been told that there's nothing that can be done for that problem. And I'm kind of at my wit's end because, you know, Stay in pain all the time, get injections, get needles stuck in your back to dull the pain down some, but not completely. And I'm hoping that you all know of something new that might be able to help me relieve more of this pain or all of it. So, so what I want to do, Robert, is for the benefit of the listeners, um, Dr. Chappies and I were talking <clears throat> about this actually before the show because of some of the controversies around fusion and, and the, the later problems that happen. But for the audience that's listening and doesn't understand what you've been through, I want him first to kind of set up kind of what you did go through, why that was done, maybe the alternatives that exist today, and then what are the what, what's happening to you now and what are the options? Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Yeah, there's a number of reasons for spinal fusions. Uh, generally, it's related to instability. It could be from fracture. It could be from tumors. And then a big group called degenerative disc disease. And fusions are done from the front through the abdomen. They're done from the back, some with uh, screws or instrumentation. And it was really all we had to offer patients up till four or five years ago if uh, traditional surgery as far as taking the disc out or freeing a nerve root up didn't work. The problem with fusions long term that we're starting to see now is even if it worked at the level that was operated on, there's a significant load transfer to the levels above or below the level. In your case, it was 5-1. Right, so, so explain load transfer, and, and you used an expression about load something versus load something before. That's correct. Explain it again, because I didn't get it, which means they're not going to get it. Well, from an engineering standpoint, something either load shares, which means it absorbs load, or it load transfers. With a fusion, it transfers the load because that level now is stiff. In your case, you had an L5-S1 level, so the only way it can transfer is to the level above, right. and, and then what happens is that level starts to get into problems. Now, anyone who's had a fusion before there's, and, and is painful, there's a number of reasons that they could still have pain. It could be related to the operation at the level you had. It could be related to the level of... Well, did you have pedicle screws put in? Yes, sir, I did. Yes, sir, I did. Now, the, the, the injections that are being done are being not in the facet joints at L4-5, but further down at the nerve base as it comes out of the spine. Right. So you're getting probably what are called selective nerve root sleeve blocks or transferaminal epidural blocks. That one right there. I never could say that word, but that's the one. Right. So that tells you there's still some narrowing at that level. 
And Ooh. there's a lot that can be done if that's what's going on. The, that little opening can be burred open through a microscopic or minimally invasive approach. A lot of times the pedicle screws themselves can be painful. Um, so that's when that's it gets a real cold here in Georgia. You know the humidity when it gets real cold, it's it is yeah, it's very painful. Right. Well, you, you have wait, a, wait, wait, wait. So, so you know, they really people can really tell barometric pressure and temperature from their back surgeries. I've heard p- patients say that. I don't know. All right, I mean, uh, it's because we're getting the science stuff. So I wonder if like we really know if that changes things. But, but I not not challenging Robert. You know, the yeah, fact that you no, make that assertion, but just that I've always been curious if science really proved that there's something there. Yeah, see, at Spine Center Atlanta, what we would do is probably get something like a CT myelogram to look at the opening for your nerve roots and then maybe nerve and muscle test. And what we're trying to find is what we call the pain generator. Where is your pain coming from still? And then what are your uh, non-surgical and then surgical options to fix it? Okay. Now, then the question goes. Um, how do I get in touch with y'all and how do I set up an appointment? Because, <laughs> I, I want to get in there and see what can be done. All right, so, I've, so, I've got nine MRIs sitting here in my closet from different doctors looking at say there's nothing can be done, but with the advancement of science and advancement of medicine the way it is, I, I don't believe that I'm just the only person on this planet that nothing can be done for. I just I, I, I have a hard time believing yeah, Well, that. based on the phone calls, my guess is you're not alone. Um, and certainly Jim knows you're not because he sees these patients all the time. All right, go ahead and give your office number, office location, and website again, and then we've got to go to break. SpineCenterAtlanta.com, 404-351-5812, 3161 Howell Mill Road in Atlanta. Robert, thanks for the call. Thank you, Jeff. Best of luck to you. Look forward to meeting you. And we are back on the weekly checkup. I'm Dr. Bruce Feinberg. We're talking today to Dr. James Chappius of Orthopedic and Spine Surgery of Atlanta. We're taking your calls, 404-872-0750. We're really focusing today on back and neck pain. And we're going to go right back to the phones and talk to Carl in Atlanta. Carl, how you doing? Thank you so much for taking my call. This is Carl in Cupcake, my guide dog in Atlanta. Carl, always great to have you calling in. Now, you know this is a short segment, so I need you to kind of get that question out pretty quick. Will do. 1997, I had an L5-S1 laminectomy anterior, I believe it was new at that time, from an Emory physician. It was very successful, but it took me seven, eight months to recuperate. My question is, unfortunately, every 12 to 15 months, for no reason whatsoever... Uh, my back goes out in the same area where they did the laminectomy, and then that lays me up for two or three weeks, and I you know, have to rely on ibuprofen. And I've rec- suggested this to my primary care physician, and she says it's just part of getting old, and I'm almost 59 years old, and I want to hear your um, expert's opinion. All right. Well, thanks. Uh- Actually, I'm not far from your age, so that's not old at all. Um, and there, there is something going on. It needs, really needs to be diagnosed. Probably the first thing I'd want to do is examine you and get an MRI scan to see what we're dealing with. But it sounds like something's uh, not quite right for that to continue to be happening. And there's so many new things that have come out now that can be done minimally invasive if you were to need surgery. But there's a lot of injections and physical therapy that can help you. But it just seems nothing against your primary care doc, but it might be time to see a specialist. All right. Thank you so much. So, Carl, Carl, I'm curious. Wait, before you go, we got another minute. Um, does this happen the same time of year, every Almost year? Almost the same time. It's when the cold – y'all were talking a barometric pressure or something like that? Well, yeah, just people talk about, like, you know, they can tell it's going to rain because right. they're back. It's usually when it's in the cold part of the year. And, you know, it's cold to walk outside, and I start to feel it sort of in my back. But I've never associated anything with that. But. No, I'm just because um, Dr. Chab was talking before about, you know, how critical hamstring uh, stretching is. And I was thinking about, you know, I'm wondering with hearing about the cold, you know, what happens when it gets cold? You stop walking, exercising maybe the way you might. And, you know, is that – the and is, is a – is a consequence of that that you get people get tighter because they're not doing the activities that keep them stretched. I'm just trying to think about why that you know if there is a certain frequency, yeah, sure, but it's sure. yeah. My I do 120 push-ups six days a week every morning. My guide dog and I walk 
30 minimum up to 50 miles a week. Otherwise, I'm in excellent physical condition. But then, like I said, once every 12 to 15 months, for no reason at all, my back goes out, and then it lays me up for almost three weeks. All right. Well, you've got some things to think about, you know, based on the comments of Dr. Chapius, and so you'll let us know if uh, what you end up doing on a on a future call. All right. Thank you. So you take much. care. Thank you. Bye. So Carl's one of our regulars. Often though, I'm I'm impressed because he usually calls about Cupcake, his dog, his guide dog, huh. and it's nice to actually talk about himself today. So okay. you should be privileged. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, great. So all right, we will be back in just a little bit with more calls, more discussions, and really getting into this controversy about spinal fusion and what you need to know about it. Stay with us. We are back on the weekly checkup. We're brought to you by Georgiology. I'm Dr. Bruce Feinberg. Today we're live in the studio with Dr. James Chapius of Orthopedic and Spine Surgery of Atlanta. We, of course, are taking your calls, 404-872-0750, and we're focusing on chronic and acute neck and back pain. And we thought that was a great way to lead into spring with spring fever in the air and everybody getting outside on this gorgeous day with a high near 70. Sun is shining. Cherries are, are in bloom and crocuses and uh, daffodils are coming up at the ground. And it just makes you want to get out there and do stuff you haven't done in months. And hopefully you won't get injured doing it. But if you do, then we want to be talking to you. So before we get back to the show, a quick message from one of our sponsors. RBM of Atlanta Sandy Springs is proud to support the weekly checkup. They'd like to thank Atlanta for 50 great years as Atlanta's Mercedes-Benz connection. Summer is upon us. I'm just talking spring, but summer is upon us. And special offers are heating up for new and pre-owned Mercedes-Benz vehicles. Visit rbmofatlanta.com for details. It is a day like today that does make you want to be in a convertible. All right. So I want to get into this controversy on spinal fusion. Um, and I was telling you that my brother-in-law just had a procedure done. And when you were last on the show, um, we were talking about spinal fusion and how it's not a bad procedure, but it's, it's a procedure today, which should be kind of maybe the last option. Um, and for a lot of people and for a lot of years, it was the only option or the first option. And I was really you know, troubled by you know how much do I, an oncologist, get involved with my brother-in-law and telling him about his doctors and what to do about second opinions. Um, and it was really like walking on eggshells how to deal with it. But I do want the audience to understand kind of a little bit of the history and background and kind of where we are today and how it's different. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, spinal fusions uh, have been done for a number of years for a number of problems, but I think uh, we all got excited as spinal surgeons in the 90s when pedicle screws or instrumentation was introduced that could help stabilize the spine and improve the fusion rates. And really, at the time, that's all we had to offer. So, so, so again, I want to get increasing clarity for the audience that maybe doesn't quite follow. So we've got these bones of the spine that are stacked one on top of the other. Correct. And and muscles and tendons are holding them in line, so that they work like they should, like a, in a spring. Or and um, and so there are segments which get too loose and they start to get out of place. Is that what happens? And that's why we have to fuse them. Well, that that's a good question. There's a number of things that can happen. You can get a fracture that it may require a fusion. There could be a tumor that requires it. Uh, the majority of spinal surgery and fusions are done for what's known as degenerative disc disease. The disc degenerates, and as you mentioned, there's some play or looseness at that segment that causes pain. And so, uh, again, those are options for patients. We try to make sure that we look at all the non-surgical options first, but that has been uh, a number of the cause for a number of patients to have fusions is related to degenerative disease or looseness, as you described it. Okay, so, and, and to remove that looseness, you're basically going to screw, put a plate in that's going to screw two segments or three segments together. So now the segment that is secure and in position is going to keep the one that's loose from moving out of position. Is that the way? That's correct. And, and probably the easiest way to look at it, you're taking two vertebrae or the bones of the black back that move and make them one. And that can be done through the front, through the stomach, called an anterior lumbar interbody fusion. It can be done from the back as a posterior lateral fusion, posterior instrumented lumbar fusion. So really, uh, it can be approached from any direction from the side. There's options now that can be done from the side. The question is, do you really need a fusion? And is fusion really the best operation now if you need something to stabilize that motion and, segment? And we loved fusion in this country. And we seem to love fusion in this country more than other countries. 
Uh, well, that's true, Bruce. And actually, there's been some numbers that have come out recently from CMS and the government that shows that spinal fusions are done probably at two or three times greater rate in America than they are in a lot of other countries, particularly in Europe. Now, you explained to me, you know, before that. So the good news is it can work. It can stabilize the loose segment and, you know, people can be free of their pain. But there's a problem in the way that it actually works that crosses down the stream issues. Yeah, that's correct. And there was a study out called the SPORT study, which really showed that lumbar fusions can work. Uh, but the best case scenario is the lumbar fusion works at that level. But because in sort of engineering terms, now you're transferring load from that fuse segment to the next segment above or below. It, now those l levels are in, can become in trouble. So that's the problem with fusion. It's a load transferring operation. And now there are new procedures that load share rather than load transfer. So they, they, they keep kind of the natural physiology intact. That, that's correct. And that, those are known as dynamic stabilization procedures, cervical disc replacements, lumbar disc replacements. And then uh, in the back of the spine, there's a device now called Coflex, which is a load sharing device. So we do now as surgeons have options that we didn't have six or seven years ago. All, all we really had were either to operate to free a nerve root of the spinal cord up, plus or minus minus the fusion. So I got a great quick story to tell you that, that you'll love. So uh, I'm into German cars, and um, but I'm also driving carpool, which limited my options. And I get this um, little sport wagon that Audi makes, and I'm driving carpool in this little like stealth car that can, it's really fast and sporty, but it looks like a wagon. And I love it. So three years later, I, my lease is up, I get another one. Well, I get my third one. And it's like the ride is totally different, and I just don't get it. So I go in, and they're giving me like, you know, you don't know German cars. No, I've been driving German cars all my life. I know German cars. This isn't riding right. Something is definitely wrong. So they're, they're treating me like I don't know what I'm talking about. And there's a new manager after a year of, of having this problem where nobody will sit in the back seat of my car because I hit like a crack in the road, and their head hits the roof <laughs> because there's like no shock absorbers. And they're telling me, no, it's a German car. It's really taut, you know. Anyway... So the new guy in the shop says, I'll just take a look. And I know he's just humoring me, but he does. And he tells me that when the car is shipped from the factory, they put these kinds of supports inside the shock absorber so the car's not bouncing a lot um, when it's being shipped. And they forgot to remove them. So I totally get when you talk about fusing these segments, instead of kind of each segment having its ability to absorb impact, when you fuse them, they treat them as one, and you're losing some of that distribution of, of absorption. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And the same load X now is not divided five ways because there's five lumbar vertebrae, but it's divided less than that. So there's a significant greater load on the levels that haven't been fused. So it fixed a problem, but it created a problem at the same time. That's correct. And it's known as subjacent disease or adjacent segment disease is what we call it in the literature. All right. So we're going to get back to the phones, but I'm glad you took a minute to explain that because I think it's kind of interesting, at least to me, hopefully. Hopefully other people listening. We'll talk to Carl in Atlanta. Hey, Carl, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Excellent. What's up? Thanks for uh, taking my call. Yeah, my father-in-law has been suffering with back pain, and he was diagnosed with uh, degenerative disc disease, and uh, he also had uh, the MRI showed um, herniation, herniated disc at a different level and a contained disc. Well, uh, he was really, he's been in a wheelchair we, uh, we all did our fair share of research, and we found the best place for him to get something done. Really, no one wanted to touch him anymore because he'd already had a couple of back surgeries, so he was uh, pretty much getting on the pain pills and all the other stuff that they were offering. So we found this place in Spain that does a procedure, which I don't believe is done in the U.S., but it's an approach, a minimally invasive approach, where they enter through the sacral hiatus, with a very small steerable catheter, and in, uh, it has two working channels. And one allows for an endoscope to go in for direct visualization, and the other is for uh, whatever instruments the surgeon might use. But in this case, my father-in-law was rolled into the hospital in a wheelchair. He, uh, the procedure took about an hour he was under twilight sedation, so he could actually talk to the surgeons during the procedure. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't remember much, but they were able to talk to him and confirm. They, they paid attention to the MRI, but they wanted to go in visually 
and uh, also be able to talk to him. So they used it as a probe and said, is this where your back hurts? And he was able to say, yes, that's exactly it. He also had leg pain, uh, pain from the back, caused by the back shooting down into the legs. But afterwards, they said what they did was they treated multiple levels. They found a few things that the MRI didn't show. Uh, they went in, and what would have, what was being recommended to be fused, the degenerative disc disease, they said that what happens are a bunch of nerve endings start forming. And, there's, uh, and then I read some literature. So, and Carl, Carl, I want you to wrap this up because of time. So, okay. I, I got to know, I gotta, did, did he walk out of the hospital at, when he came in with wheelchair? Yeah, after an hour of procedure, about two hours in recovery, he walked out of the hospital. And how long ago was that? This was three years ago. And he's been walking since? Has, been, he's doing perfectly. All right. So, I, I you know... It, so my question uh, is, yeah, it, why, can, is why, that being why, done here why, in the why, states? Why isn't that being done in the U.S.? Well, I'm not sure it isn't being done in the states. So let let's get let let's let Dr. Chappius talk to you. What you're <clears throat> basically talking about is endoscopic spine surgery. It is being done here. There's a, a really big center in Phoenix that does a lot of that. It's not as common with most of us, uh, but it is being done here. And it also shows, I think, that there are a lot of different approaches, both operative and non-operatively, for back pain. There isn't just one approach that works for everybody. And I think this is an example of a case uh, that really did well with endoscopic spine surgery. But it is done in the States, and uh, it is very successful sometimes, as you've uh, described to us. There's a society now called SELD, S-E-L-D, I found, and that's an acronym for uh, SACO endoscopic laser decompression and um, what they did was they were able to vaporize the herniated disc and they were able to shrink the contained disc so he got three surgeries with one tiny incision I promise you the incision was about three centimeters I mean three millimeters Right. Well, I think the, the biggest lesson for us as spine surgeon, there isn't one answer to every problem. So endoscopic spine surgery is good, but it's not going to work on most patients. It, is, it does work on some. Carl, thanks for your call. We've got to go to break. Thanks. All right. So before we go, I'm really curious. Um, when we talk about the fact that there are these new procedures, but that's, that's the nature of medicine and the nature of science. Is there going to keep being new things that are going to come along. And maybe we can, in the next segment, talk about some of the changes and breakthroughs that have happened in just the last five years. Yes, absolutely. A lot of good things have happened. All right. This is the Weekly Checkup. I'm your host, Dr. Bruce Feinberg, and we are live in the studio with Dr. James Chappius of Spine Center Atlanta. We're taking your calls, 404-872-0750. Before we get back to the calls, let me just remind you that this hour is presented by George Urology's Kidney Stone Hotline, 1-855-STONE-11, available day or night for scheduling an appointment within 24 hours. All right, let's go ahead and hit the phones again, and let's talk to Ty Sharla in Tyrone. I have two basic questions. I'll tell you what the problem is. The two questions are, uh, who should I see, what type of doctor on the south side of Atlanta. I live uh, near Peachtree City. Here's the problem. In August, I injured myself by shoving a heavy load. I just pushed very hard, went to my knees in pain. Now the pain is ongoing. The nature of it has changed. I feel like kerosene has been poured on my back and someone lit it. Uh, the x-ray says that there is compression deformity of the end plate of L1. There's mild compression deformity of the superior end plate of T11. There's moderate disc space narrowing predominantly on the left at the L4, L5 level with other disc spaces mildly, mildly narrowed. Um, All right, so, Charlotte, I can have you read the entire MRI report on the radio. That's it. All right, good. It's not an MRI. It's an X-ray. It's just a plain film. Right. Okay. Well, do you, do you have any other um, imaging studies, an MRI or anything like that? Not from this injury, no. I don't know who to see or where to go. Well, I'm, I'm a bit biased. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon, so I think you should see an orthopedic spine surgeon. Well, I mean, but, but this is this is so relevant in a way, Charlotte, because you're asking a question. We were talking about it. 
you know, during the break, we've had some calls and people have done different things. And there are questions. Who do you see? There are spine centers that are operated by radiologists, anesthesiologists, neurosurgeons, orthopedists, kind of, you know, how do you, you know, how do you know the difference? And and then they recommend procedures. And are those procedures covered by insurance? Are they FDA approved? I mean, what, so it's so hard, I think, for the average consumer. And you're asking that very specific question that we were just talking about. It, we, exactly. And I, th- I think either a neurosurgeon or orthopedic spine surgeon, because then we can refer you to anyone who may need help you. And, and what it sounds like, you've got pain from a fracture, either a compression fracture or something like that. There's a lot of percutaneous procedures that can be done, such as vertebroplasty that can help you. There's a number of specialists that do that procedure, but I really think initially my recommendation would be to be evaluated by a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic spine surgeon who can then do the appropriate imaging studies and then give you your treatment options. Can you recommend anyone south of Atlanta? You know, I don't really know anyone in particular in that area, but I know in the city of Atlanta, there's a number of good neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine surgeons. Um, you know, Google may help you with that, or we'd be happy to see you at Spine Center Atlanta. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're Thanks welcome. for the call, Charlotte. All right. And now we will talk to Sandra in Lawrenceville. Hey, Sandra. Hey. How are you? I'm great this afternoon. It's a beautiful afternoon. Yes, it is. I have a quick question for you. I don't know if you'll be able to help. I have a husband who has a disease called ankylosing spondylitis. He was diagnosed with this 19 years ago, and um, there ha- there just is not any uh, anything that we know of that can be done for this problem. And I was wondering if you guys, if we came to see you if you might could tell us anything he could do other than just what he's doing now do do you know of anyone that is studying this particular disease because it is something that nothing can be done for all right so sandra when you say that you've been told nothing can be done what specialists have you seen already uh we have seen uh, several neurologists when he was diagnosed with this problem they said that there were not enough people at the time that have had the uh, problem to be looked at. So, of course, he, he got this problem at 42, was taken out of work at 44, and he's now 63. He's completely bent over, and his back is in sort of a round position. So I would love to make an appointment to come into your spine center and just let you take a look at him. We'd be happy to see you. That that's a very see your husband. That's a really tough problem. There isn't any cure, as you know, for the disease. But when a patient gets to the point um, where your husband is, there are operations that can help straighten him up. They're very high risk operations, but they are operations that can be done to help him. But it is oh, a great. it's a tough problem. Okay, so let me get your phone number, and, and uh, I'm sure you said it before, but I just started listening to the show. All right, no, 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 we, we try to do it every segment, but it's, go ahead. It's Spine Center Atlanta, 404-351-5812. 351-5812. 5812. 5812. Yes, ma'am. And, and com. That's the easiest thing to remember, too. SpineCenterAtlanta.com. Thank you so much. If if there could be something to straighten him up at all, uh, we would be the happiest people in the world because he's been literally sitting, uh, you know, he, he just can't do anything. So, Sandra, was he seeing a rheumatologist during this interim of 20 years? Yes, he did. He did see a rheumatologist, and they said there was nothing they could do uh, except put him on medication for the pain. His uh, they, dis- So they didn't recommend uh, any immunologic-based therapies? No. No? All right. Nothing. They said that his was so advanced at such a young age that they did not, there was nothing that could be done for him. It's a tough problem. Yes, we, we have found that out. But I will be contacting you, and we will be into the Spine Center. Thank you Thanks so for your much. Call. Thank you. All right, sounds like you got your hands full on this one, though. That's not easy. No, there's an osteotomy that can be done. There's a guy at Emory that does those a lot, John Heller. I'd probably send her over to see him because it's real high risk. There's a risk of quadriplegia, paraplegia, but it can be done. It's a closing wedge osteotomy of the spine. Wow. But a lot of times, see, they're to this point where they can't even look up. So it's usually what you do is address the cervical spine first with a closing wedge osteotomy. 
and then then you get their head upright. Right. Not, they don't they don't become flexible, no. but you just change that horrible that's, angle. That's correct. So they can look forward. That's correct. All right. Wow. <clears throat> All right. So um, you know, as we we've learned with the calls, there's a lot going on in the world of spine and back surgery. It's not all just disc disease. No, it's huge. Yeah. Um, so you know, for those who like Sandra just you know joined in, you know, I wanted to get back to, you know, some of the things that people can do. Obviously, if, if you've got a genetic disorder like ankylosing spondylitis, you know, your die was cast. You know, you got dealt a bad card. Um, but for a lot of people they are their own worst enemies because they don't take care of themselves. So I want to go back to what can you be doing to prevent? What do you do to have to stay physically fit enough in order not to get, hopefully, or limit the amount of spine and neck surge and neck problems that could lead to seeing you? I don't want to put you out of business, but I'm not worried. No, I understand. Well, right. I think the biggest thing is stay active. Don't just work, get in your car and come home and watch TV or get on the internet. Stay active. Do something aerobic at least three or four times a week, 15, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, if you're overweight, as we talked about, try to get on some sort of weight reduction plan. If you're a smoker, stop smoking and try to live, live a healthy lifestyle. And that's probably the biggest message I think that we could give uh, viewers or listeners is that live a healthy lifestyle, keep your weight down, don't smoke, it'll help. And what's interesting is that people are thinking, so what, what does smoking have to do with with you know my spine but actually there is data for it absolutely there's data there the problem is it makes the disc won't we'll get into the science but it makes the disc more brittle so that there can be herniations at a greater level it, it, the, it the nicotinic acid and the lowered oxygen tension in the blood I think combine to cause nutritional problems for the disc and then it can be injured at a greater rate than someone who doesn't smoke you know, and I so I think people need to hear that. I, you know, I think they don't, they almost think it's like platitudes. You know, oh, everybody's going to tell me I shouldn't smoke. I know that, but there's something very specific here. There is a direct correlation. It's not just do healthy things. The same thing with weight reduction. There is almost kind of I don't remember the physics of it or the math of it, but but in terms of the weight bearing of, of you know what those twenty extra pounds actually do on your spine. Well, I, you know, this, it's funny. My old chief used to say it's like driving a Cadillac on a Hyundai frame. I mean, you, you've got <laughs> too much weight on the given uh, spinal. Uh, anatomy that you have, and it's going to overload that uh, disc or wherever. So the key is to keep your weight down uh, to a level that's going to help in, encourage health. And the exercise piece, I think, is also interesting because as you get older, there are a certain amount of normal aches and pains. And, you know, we were talking about the gentleman who called, and you were nice enough to tell him that 59 isn't old, and I was going to give you a high five because <laughs> I'm 59. And um, but But part of that is one of the differences, I still do everything. I'm still in the gym as much. And at this point, I haven't really seen major reductions in my workouts, you know, in terms of measuring what I can do. My running's a little slower. I'm still lifting as much as I did. Um, but, but what I do notice, I wake up every morning and I'm a little stiff and I'm a little sore. It usually clears within 30 minutes. Um, but I'm noticing those differences. But you know, I, I, I talk to friends who like they don't do it anymore because they wake up stiff. Not like, no, that's even like more the reason to be doing it. Absolutely. The key is you must, we must stay active, particularly as we get older. And, you know, one thing I've done, and we offer this at Spine Center Atlanta, but I, I think massages are so helpful. Deep tissue massage work. I, I try to do one, uh, get one two or three times a month, but that's helped me continue to stay active. And so just another thought for um, active All right, the massage folks. therapists are going to be ringing off the hook in a little bit, but I want to ask you more about that because I have never been a big massage person. We'll talk about that. When we, we are back on the weekly checkup. We're brought to you by George Urology. I'm Dr. Bruce Feinberg. Today we're live in the studio with Dr. James Chapius of Spine Center Atlanta. You can learn more about him in the practice at SpineCenterAtlanta.com. And, of course, we're taking your calls, 404-872-0754 or 472 so early in the show, we got into something, and I wanted to understand it a little bit better, but we've had so many calls, we didn't really get back to it. And that's this notion of uh, people who have recurrent pain after they've had fusion surgery. And a lot of times, it isn't right away. They initially do well, but then down the road. And because their back has already been operated on, they're hearing that there's nothing more that can be done. Um, and so now they become kind of chronic pain patients. And that's like the worst of all scenarios. So... When we were talking earlier, I was getting this, I was hearing from you that that's changed, that, that something's happening that's different now. Well, I think what's happening is we, we're willing to look at 
patients like this to see are there any other options a patient can have other than just being put into a pain clinic long term. Uh, nothing wrong with pain clinics. They're, they're certainly necessary. But I think there's a number of patients that are sent to pain clinics that may have a problem that can be addressed either with injections or another operation. Now, again, I understand most patients who've had one spine operation don't even want to think about a second. But there are a number of things that can be done with injections. And my partner, Dr. Cherica Polly, who is interventional spine specialist, does a lot of great things like that and hopefully keeps the patients from having surgery. But there are options other than just being put in a pain clinic and put on narcotics. And, and obviously that's so much you know, in the news today is this explosion of narcotic use in this country and the problems with dependency. Um, with narcotics that arises from, you know, possibly the lack of alternatives. And then people who maybe, unfortunately, you know, maybe are drug seeking, but there seem to be a lot of patients who don't want that option. They're left with that as the only resource. That's correct. And, and I think once you're put on narcotics, even if you don't have an addiction, you can develop a tolerance that uh, r- makes you require more and more medication as time goes on. So I think, I think patients should really be given all other options first before being put on long-term narcotic use. And if, if that is the only option, uh, it really being done by someone who has training in that, who has the ability to check for someone who's becoming dependent and can help them prevent that. So when, when we talk about spine fusion, is there, is there a, a certain period of time when people typically get problems? Is there a certain time period after the surgery when they get into that issue? Well, the, the first point is, are there any intraoperative or immediate postoperative complications that could cause pain? Assuming all goes well, there aren't any, then patients can go a good period of time and never have problems again. But a- after time goes on, there are a number of patients that can develop problems, as we mentioned earlier, at the level above or below, which is called adjacent segment disease. And I want to get to that when we come back after this break. Stay with us. And we are back on the weekly check. We're brought to you by George Urology. I'm Dr. Bruce Feinberg, your host, and we're live in the studio today with Dr. James Chapius of Spine Center Atlanta. Give us a call, 404-872-0750. And before we get back to our conversation, here's a message from our friends at DeKalb Medical. You can have your cake and eat it too. Come walk a mile with a certified diabetes educator and get your questions answered about diabetes self-management and healthy lifestyle choices. This event is free and held every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. on DeKalb Medical's North Decatur campus. Please call 404-501-WELL. That's 404-501-9355 for more information or to register. All right. So, Jim, I got to get back into this failed fusion because I'm not quite following what fails how it fails, when it fails. I mean, I get the fact that nothing is, is perfect and, you know, it's neither a perfect solution nor it's going to be perfect forever. But a lot of your research has focused on trying to understand because you see these patients who come in and they have pain. Yes. And they've had a fusion and now they have pain. And maybe their x-rays don't look bad. You know, it looks like things are still where they're supposed to be. But obviously they wouldn't have pain if everything was, was the way it should be. That's correct. And so the real, the first question always is, uh, are the screws, if you have instrumentation, is the instrumentation where it's supposed to be? Is there any malposition of the instrumentation? Then has the fusion healed? Um, the second, the third point is, have we operated on all the painful motion segments? There may be three or four levels involved, but we've chosen to only operate on one or two. So there's a lot of things to look at in a patient who's had a previous operation to see whether or not there's an etiology for them to con- Obviously, there's something wrong. They're continuing to be in pain. And if they're of sound mind, then there's something going on that we need to look at. Okay. So I'm fascinated by some of the recent research you've done around the screws because there was a lot of creativity just to even figure out how you were going to even test the problem. Yes, correct. that's correct. And w- one of the problems with the pedicle screws or the screws in the pillars of the spine is they're at a much greater strength than the bone. So if you were to talk to any mechanical engineer, they'd say, well, there's a mismatch of materials, one stronger than the other, and then you're cyclically loading this over time. So generally, one of the materials is going to fail. All right. So, so to understand the screws... Tell me how, again, what you're doing in order to, to stabilize 
the, the, the loose segments? And what role do the screws play? Well, there was, there's different ways to do that, but pedicle screws are screws that are placed down the pillar of the spine to stabilize the two motion segments or more while the bone graft that's placed in for the fusion heals. Well, once the fusion's healed, then the question is what happens with these pedicle screws? And, and that's the same kind of idea like having plates that are done for broken bones, whether it's arms or legs, where they can go back in and remove the plate and the screws later on because the bone has now knitted together and it's got a solid bone. Yeah, that's correct. And, and over the years, I've all, when I've reoperated on patients, we've found a lot of these screws to be extremely loose. And so I started scratching my head wondering, do the loose screws actually cause pain? Do they not cause pain? So we, pre <clears throat> we presented a paper where we looked at clinically the results of removing screws, and it showed that they improved about 70%. Um, and so there was an improvement. But then the question was, uh, why are they loosening, or how are they loosening? So then we looked biomechanically at that problem. So, and one of the things that I thought was fascinating, and you had to work with engineers to figure this out, is how are you going to measure that? Because you're screwing it in like, with a screwdriver, kind of, right? Yes. And you screw in a screw. That's correct. And then you're going to determine, how do you know it's loose? I mean, obviously, we think of loose where you can wiggle the screw back and forth, but it may not be that loose. But you actually were trying to measure the amount of torque it took to un to screw clockwise versus counterclockwise. How much does it take to put it in versus how much then what is it to take it out? Is that Do I get it right? That's exactly what we did. And I, I worked with Joel Borkel from Georgia Tech, who was working on his PhD in mechanical engineering at the time, and we developed... Uh, a protocol where we measured, we we fe we got a uh, torque wrench and sterilized it. And Every we, mechanic who's listening is just like you know salivating right now. This is so cool. Yeah, so we sterilized a torque wrench. We measured the torque as you insert the screw, and then patients that were painful, and we removed the screws later. We we measured the removal torque. And we found that there was an 80% decrease in removal torque. So our hypothesis were that screws loosen over time, and this data supported that. And, and again, you can remove those screws and with no detriment to the patient because now the bone's already knitted, the screws aren't necessary. Yes, and you, do, you need to make sure ahead of time, though, that your fusion is solid because if the fusion isn't solid and you remove the screws, then a patient will have increased back pain because of the fusion not being solid. So it's interesting, we were talking earlier in the show and trying to get like meat around this. And, and for me, and, and I've got medical background, I'm thinking for people who have listening who have none, but trying to get my, my, my head around exactly when you have these failed fusions, what is it that's going on? And now I'm starting to get it. I'm starting to get, there's a lot of different things that could be happening. It could be another segment and whether that segment was diseased before, but it could be diseased now. It could be that you've got just something as simple as loose screws, which are now rubbing in bone and causing new onset pain. And that, they can easily just be pulled out and you're fine. That's correct. And, and actually there, there's also, most patients, especially if they have degenerative disc disease, have what's known as spinal stenosis or lateral recess stenosis which is narrowing where the nerve root comes out. And in the literature, literature, the number one reason for failed back surgery syndrome is the failure to recognize and treat that narrowing where the nerve root comes out. So another operation may be as simple as microscopic, what we call laminoforaminotomy, which means we open up the opening where the nerve root comes out. All right. And, and, and was, I also find really interesting in terms of the way you approach this is, so you do this research, you work with the biomechanical engineers, you get the torque wrench, you figure this thing out with the screws, but you don't stop there, right? Then you invent a new screw in order to try to solve the problem. So tell me about that. Well, I, I guess I was watching a fence post put in, a fence put up one day, and I watched a hole being dug, a pole's put in, cement's poured. But once the cement's poured, then you can stretch as much fencing around that as you want. So I thought, why not be able to put holes in the end of one of these screws where cement can be injected? So we developed that. And, and, and so to, for people to understand, there is, there is a bone cement that's, that's used and has been used for years in spine surgery? Well, it's, it's, was been, it was used for years with cementing in total hips, cementing in total knees. So I thought, well, what if we put one or two cc's of that cement down through the screw and anchored it into the bone? And? And it worked. So uh, Medtronic had, uh, purchased that, and it's being used around the world. We, haven't, we don't have FDA clearance yet, though, here in the States. And how many countries have, have approved it? 
I think not, it's being used. I think ninety countries now. Ninety countries, and so, but you know, we're we're a little stricter here, and you're waiting for the FDA approval. Yes. Um, and so that's pretty exciting, though. But I love the fact that how you in this kind of methodologic approach, where you know you started with observing a problem, trying to figure out the problem, testing it, getting the resources you needed, and then once you've proved that there really is a problem here, then trying to come up with a solution formulating the solution and getting it back into the market. I mean, it's, uh, you know, there's so much that's wrong with medicine, but a lot of it is the fact that so many observations don't then translate into solutions. That's the fun. This is the fun part of medicine and surgery for me, though, is to find a problem that may be out there and, and try to decide, is there a better way to do something? Is there a new way to do something that can help a patient for a problem that doesn't have a lot of solutions? And spine surgery is an area that there's a lot of active research going on. It's, it's exciting to see a lot of the new products that are coming out that can help patients. So the, the other thing that this echoes for me based on some of the calls we had earlier today is understanding what the research is or, or what the research that's been done that supports whatever you're going to have done as a patient, which is as opposed to you see this article on the magazine on the airplane, you know, for some laser treatment and it sounds cool because it's lasers or it's minimally invasive or it's non-invasive. But has it been studied and where is it published and was it peer reviewed and you know, uh, w- or is it just somebody saying that they've got something? Yeah. And and you'd like to think, and I think people believe somehow that if, you know, if they see it in a magazine, then obviously it's true. Well, I think as you mentioned earlier, if you think it's too good to be true, it it uh, it may be. And I I think buyer beware if you're on the internet and you're looking at something that no one else does. I mean, most of the time, if there's something that works, most of us are going to be using it or doing it. So I think as you look at some of these uh, options that most surgeons or most doctors aren't doing, really do your research to see uh, what the results are, what the complications are. Does this doctor have anything published that shows the results of this given procedure, not just that one or two people did well? And if it is really, you know, kind of revolutionary, then it's probably part of a clinical trial, and you should be signing an informed consent if you're going to be a you know subject to it. Absolutely, and even a lot of the where if it's a device, the companies that sell the device a lot of times have information that you can get. If it's an endoscope or some kind of new instrument, there's a company that makes that, and they're generally willing to share the data of things they have with you. So do your homework on these procedures that seem too good to be true. All right, so we got a few minutes left in this segment, and as we were talking about this work that you've been doing. So what do you see on the horizon? Where do you think the new things are going to be? You know, given it's a dynamic field, there is a lot of research being done. What do you see in the next five years? What do you think is going to be out there? Well, I I hate to say the fact that I had an interest in stabilizing screws. I think that we're going to evolve away from, not completely, but I think we're going to start looking for other options for the painful degenerative, other surgical options for the painful degenerative spine other than fusions, such as dynamic stabilization. Um, the other interesting area is the whole biologic sort of treatment of pain. And my partner, Dr. Cherica Polly, now is doing stem cell injections, amniotic stem cell injections, into the vertebral disc for patients that have annular tears. I mean, it's it's uh, cutting edge. Is it FDA approved yet or not? Uh, it's it's. I think it's approved. I'm not sure if it's approved for that indication. Right. Um, but again, what's your other option if that doesn't work? You're looking at a fusion or a big operation. Right. So our thought is, let's see if this may work. And and, ha- and, and so are you going to study this in the way you've studied other things and keep records on all these patients and. Y- Yes, absolutely. And possibly Doc- publish this work? Absolutely. Dr. Cherica Polly is looking at that now. We're going to have a control group of patients with annular tears that didn't have the injections to see how the injection fares against the patients who have the annular tear without injections. Cool, cool. All right. So we're going to go to break. When we come back, you'll have a chance to kind of give us some of the highlights today of some of the things you picked up from the audience that you want to be able to respond to and have a chance once again to share with them how they can be in touch with you. So everybody. So we are back on the weekly checkup. If we didn't get to your call, send us your questions at weeklycheckup.com or find us on Facebook and Twitter for healthy living tips throughout the week. This hour was presented by George Urology's Kidney Stone Hotline. That's 1-855-STONE-11, available day or night for scheduling an appointment within 24 business hours. My thanks today to Dr. James Chapius of Atlanta Spine Specialists. Uh, No, I got it wrong that time. Atlanta Spine Center. 
Spine Center Atlanta. Spine Center Atlanta. Boy, I was going so well. <laughs> Seven segments, I nailed it. I blew it on the last one. Spine Center Atlanta for being live in the studio. Um, Jim, I thought it was great. I, um, I Calls were um, plentiful, but also the topics were really interesting. Thank you. Um, clearly, you're really passionate about what you do. You continue to do active research. The coolest thing you told me that we didn't share on the air is you just got an appointment at Georgia Tech. So t- tell me about that before we close. I'm really, really honored. I met with Dr. Goldberg this past week at the Petit Institute, and I uh, was given the honor of being um, a place on the faculty of the Petit Institute where we'll be working with design teams of engineers on uh, looking at problems. And, and uh, there's such some brilliant minds at Georgia Tech to be able to have the opportunity to work with these young engineers is exciting. So it does speak to the fact that, I, I, at least from the, the, the docs we've had on the show, you know, your passion for the engineering and the biomechanical aspects of what you do um, seem to be pretty unique. I mean, a lot of people obviously get into their field because they, they love their field, and a lot of surgeons love surgery, but you love the engineering piece of this a lot, and you continue to, it, it seems to impact your research. So um, I think sharing that passion, you know, with the audience, you know, in closing minutes, why you do what you do, um, and how they can get in touch with you would be nice as a, as a close. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Yeah, maybe I'm just a frustrated mechanic. My father was a mechanic. Um, I like mechanical devices, and I think the spine and the problems related to uh, back and neck problems are definitely biomechanically uh, oriented sometimes. Um, so we, we're at Spine Center Atlanta. Uh, we're, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon. We have a comprehensive spine care program, including a surgery center, imaging. Dr. Chera Kapali uh, is my partner, who is a board-certified physiatrist who's done a fellowship in interventional spine. Tim Marlowe is the head of our physical therapy to program uh, department and has an incredible spine program. Uh, and really, to, to anyone out there with back problems, the question, when you're going to a physician, look and see who they are. What is their specialty? Uh, are they really qualified to be doing what you're going to see them for? I think if you stick originally with an orthopedic surgeon, a neurosurgeon, and then go from there, uh, that's always safe. Physiatrists, I think, are also people to consider. But do your homework. Make sure where you're going is, uh, is reputable and has qualified people to treat your problems. I think uh, great words of wisdom for whatever um, the medical problem is in terms of how people should be educated consumers. I'm Dr. Bruce Feinberg. This has been the Weekly Checkup. Be well.